made it. You graduated high school. I'm totally amazing. I can't help but feel I had some small part in how you turned out. Sometimes I think I might be going crazy from sexual frustration. You just hate every single guy on the face of the earth. That's not true. I just hate all these extroverted, pseudo-bohemian losers. You guys up for some reggae tonight? Do you have any other old records besides these? Seymour does. Who does? Oh, uh, him. He's the man with the records. What, are we in slow motion here? Come on, what are you, hypnotized? Have some more kids, why don't you? John Pehichan who? to place one student from your graduating class for a full one-year scholarship and I took the liberty of submitting your name. This could be a really great thing for you. Would I have to take classes and stuff? <laughs> well. I'm just not the kind of guy who has a type. Every guy has a type. What about her? Whoa. Would you go out with her? As long as she's breathing. times I tell you, no chef, no service. Get the hell out of my store. What do you think this is? Club Med? It's America, dude. Learn the rules. Welcome back. Welcome back to the show. Oh, boy. I'm excited to talk about this movie. I am, too. This is a really fun one. It's a good one. Well, listeners out there, my name's Pete. And I'm Scott. And, and these, these are, are the, the movies, movies that, that made, made us gay. gay. Yay. Just us today. We do not have a guest. No guests. We had. We don't need them. We've had a good lineup of guests, but it's just us today. Yes, indeed, we have had a really good lineup of guests lately. But you know, hey, our two sparkling personalities are more than enough to make this I episode. Think so. so we're going. So we're going into our October lineup. So yes. I guess that we did a movie with something spooky in the title <laughs> that's true we are talking about ghost world from 2001 directed by terry zwigoff yes uh, uh written by terry zwigoff and daniel Klaus, who wrote the graphic novel ghost world which was published in 1993 to march of 97 in Klaus comic book series eight ball okay so daniel Klaus wrote a comic book called eight ball and it was a little Ghost section World of the comic book, of. yep. Okay. And then Terry Zweigoff directed Crumb. Crumb. I meant to watch Crumb before we were recording, and I did not get to it. Oh, uh, well. It's been a movie that has been on my list for well over 10 years, and I just haven't gotten to it yet. It's I've one heard, of those. I've heard nothing but great things about it. Though. Yeah, of course. And it kind of sets the tone for kind of his career directing anything that's not a documentary sure i think but yeah ghost world uh nominated for the academy award for best adapted screenplay do you know what it lost to pete no it lost to akiva goldsman's script for a beautiful mind Aww. right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that sucks i mean in retrospect can i tell you a secret i've never seen a beautiful mind uh, you're not as much. <laughs> Sorry, Jen. Uh, Aniston. Connolly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Jennifer Connolly. Didn't she win an, uh, an Academy Award for that movie? Yeah, she won the Best Supporting Actress oh, Oscar. goodness gracious. Well, it, uh, that movie won the adapted screenplay over Ghost World. Yes, it did. Interesting. I think it was I also mean, nominated with Lord of the Rings in 2001. So, like, all of the award recognition for this movie falls under the category of a comic book adaptation yeah getting an adapted screenplay this is true i mean i feel like (laughs) well it's interesting because do you remember when logan got that screenplay nomination a few years ago and everyone Uh, was just like oh my god a comic book movie has like cracked yeah the screenplay lineup but ghost world did it before logan did yeah which is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, Ghost World sure. is a, a graphic novel. There it's like no superheroes. Although I think Enid Coleslaw is a superhero in her own right. But this no. is very true. I mean, she has the she has the cat woman cowl. cowl. Yes. yes she and does. I feel like graphic novel is the word that you would use for a comic book that you read for college credit. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I feel like everybody had their like graphic novel phase and just kind of figured out that you could like get these comic books from the library and you're just like, what is this? They're just about like slice of I'm life. I'm trying to think of what one of my first big experience or like one of my first introductions to graphic novels was. Mm-hmm. And it was probably looking into Ghost World mm-hmm. when I saw it and finding out what it was based on. And that's the whole rabbit hole of adult graphic novel or like adult graphic novels that are just sort of skewed to a very specific type of person sure too yeah so do we want to talk about our first introductions to ghost world when we first watched it um yeah why don't you go first so i remember getting teen movie line when i was (laughs) around 16 years old okay and movie line was a kind of a magazine like premiere magazine that would just kind of a monthly movie magazine. And I remember they did in their summer issue for 2001. And I remember I was taking a trip to California at the time. So Mm -hmm. I was kind of scoping out all of the movies that I could watch on the plane ride to California. And I remember there was a little write up on ghost world and it was the image of Thora Birch in the, in the Catwoman uh, mask mask. Sure. And just thinking this movie looks so cool. (laughs) And I was a big fan of Thora Birch from American Beauty. And I think that I just wanted to kind of watch something cool. Yeah. Like, and I just knew immediately this was a really under the radar movie that just had a coolness about it. Yeah. And I remember when I came to California to visit my uncle, I really wanted to go to it. But the only theater that I think was playing it was... The Sunset Five. I think it would have had to have been the Sunset Five, and that would have tracked. Yeah, that for sounds about right. This time, it probably would have opened at the Sunset Five. Yeah, and just sort of logistics of kind of traveling, getting your ass to Hollywood, getting our ass to um, Hollywood in that specific area of Hollywood. We didn't see it, but always a movie on my radar. Yeah, and that was probably. I think that it debuted at this, the Seattle International Film Festival. I don't know if it was shown at Sundance, but it might have been. But yeah. It was just kind of a movie that I remember right when it came out. So I was onto this movie pretty early. Okay. What about you? Well, when did you actually see it? Oh, well, I I mean, I didn't see it until I rented it from my local video store. Which was? The movie store. No, well, when when was this that you rented so this it? Would the have, next day? This would have came out uh, probably around late 2001, maybe early 2002 mm-hmm. probably around like november or so and did it live up to your expectations of course <laughs> i think that it i think that it kind of surpassed my expectations i don't know what i was really in for when watching it yeah but i loved it it yeah. just was a movie that it was about teenage characters or characters that were just out of high school and i had never seen anything like it before yeah that i had never seen these type these type of girls in a movie before. And this was kind of the late nineties of like the big teen boom. And none of those movies remotely look like this at all too. Yeah. So what about you, Pete? Uh, I have a vague memory of it coming out and, uh, a close friend of mine really wanted to see it. And he, you know, fancied himself a movie person and he was like all about it. Never got around to seeing it in the theater. And I always thought that it was, probably going to be a little too dry and the characters seemed a little mean to me i wasn't sure how funny it was going to be so i knew it was this like indie cool movie but i thought that there was going to be something like irredeemable about it that it was just going to be super dark or that like somebody was going to like murder someone or somebody or something. I just wasn't sure where it was going to go yeah. because I know from these like crazy comic book world, that is this, you know, specific, uh, alternative adult graphic novel situation. I just was like, I don't know. These characters are either going to be too off putting to the point where I'm not going to like anybody in it. I thought it was going to go in that kind of like American Splendor kind of direction. Sure. Or it was going to go... Yeah, I don't know. I just wasn't sure. So I just kind of avoided it for a while. And then I remember when I did see it, I was just like, oh, okay. These characters are assholes, but they're funny. At least. 
<laughs> at least they're funny. And um, yeah, it's a very specific movie. Enid, the main character, it's like, I've been in that girl's bedroom before. Definitely. These I were- know somebody who has exactly that. And these were the type of girls that I would have hung out with in high school. Yeah. Like I would have hung out with the Enid and Rebecca types of my high school. I yeah. would have sat next to them uh, in art class. We would have talked to each other. So, yeah, I feel like I knew these girls. Yeah. Um, I think the casting is really good. I feel like I was not super familiar familiar with scarlett johansson at the time i was um you're, you're a big horse whisperer fan i mean the horse whisperer shot in montana so mm. i feel like i went to the horse whisperer and i remember seeing her in it and i remember just sort of recognizing her from bit child actor roles and stuff like home alone three and <laughs> life with mikey <laughs> the best so i just sort of i just kind of knew who she was i don't know why sure but the Horse Bus Brew was a big one because that shot in my home state. Okay. And it was a big deal because okay. it was a Robert Redford movie shooting at a Bozeman. Sure. I mean, they were both teenagers when they shot this. I think Scarlett was probably under 18 when they shot it. And yeah. Maybe Thora was just shy over 18. Yeah. She would have just been coming off of American Beauty. And American Beauty, I mean, that's kind of a whole nother podcast. There's things about American <laughs> Beauty... That definitely do not age that well in 2020. Yeah. Thora's performance is not one of them. No, she's like, great in she it. She is the best. She is one of the best parts of that movie next yeah. to, like, obviously, Annette Benning. Yeah. And I think that she's incredible in this movie. Yeah, she is. I can't picture anybody else in this role. Well, you know this role. who it was almost. She was cast was Christina Ricci. Yeah. So... I remember watching the Criterion, and Thora has a funny story where she was kind of pursuing Terry for this movie. Mm -hmm. I think that she read, maybe for Rebecca, she wanted to read for Enid, but they're just like, you know, I just don't really see you as the Enid type. That's so weird. we're going to be going with Christina Ricci. Yeah. And she talks about how she ran into Christina Ricci's agent. In Los Angeles. And she just happened to mention, like, Ghost World. Like, so what's happening with Ghost World? And her agent was just like, you know, Christina's not going to do it. She felt she feels like she's done this type of movie before. And Christina had just come off of The Opposite of Sex and Buffalo 66. So she's going to pass on it. Yeah. So Thor was just like, okay. Cha-ching. So when she <laughs> met up with Terry again, she dyed her hair. Okay. To look like Enid. Yeah. Black. And... That's kind of when it clicked for the casting of the role. Yeah. And I wouldn't have it any other way. No, she looks the part. She she looks like the drawings of Enid. If you didn't know mm-hmm. any better, you'd think the adaptation. It, you would have th- thought it was a comic adaptation of the movie. Because yeah. they fit their characters so well. And almost kind of when you look at Christina Ricci, it makes sense in the moment. Yeah. But it just would have been way too on the nose. It's a little easy. And I feel like she could, she would have done well with the role. Um, but I don't know. I think there's something about Thora's performance in this that's just so, like, easygoing and natural. And just seems like the kind of shit yes. that she would pull. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. I know that girl. I've hung out with that girl. She, I've... Definitely. I've talked <laughs> shit with this girl. Yeah. Before. Yeah, yeah. Their delivery with each other... I, was was it Richard Roper that said Scarlett Johansson sleepwalks through this movie? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's a compliment because I just kind of think that's just the character of Rebecca. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, but yeah, I think Christina Ricci is very... It's very, like, like you said, it's on the nose. It's very, like, mm-hmm. easy casting it's very like oh like who are we gonna get to play fred flintstone oh fucking john goodman just get him um it's just not putting in a lot of thought and it's like she would have done fine but yeah i think thora birch was just kind of perfect so we first get introduced to these two at graduation day yes yes um this whole movie takes place it's somewhere out in the valley in southern california and it's kind of funny because i think that when they started shooting this movie i think they tried to do a this could be anywhere in america Uh but when you watch it it's the san fernando valley yeah like let's not let's not kid ourselves 
this is the valley. Yeah, Ina's apartment that she shares mm-hmm. with her dad. Well, I mean, when we when the movie first starts, she's dancing in her bedroom. Yeah. To this 60s Bollywood surf rock, the song that you heard in the trailer. Again, it's one of those things where you see that and the video is playing on her television. So it's from the movie and it's just this super like it's right out of a Tarantino movie. It's a, it's 60s Bollywood. It's it's these men in black and white suits. Everybody's wearing domino masks. The girl is in like a gold fringe little like it's number. A, it's very Batman. Yeah. And uh the Green Hornet and let's see if I can pronounce the song. John Pina Jonaho <laughs> by Muhammad Rafi. And Muhammad Rafi was a big pop star in India in the sure. 60s. The song was like, yeah. Yeah. John Pe- John Pechan Ho. Pechan Ho. Who, who knows? We're yeah. saying it wrong. We don't speak that language. Hindi. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just this. It's a, it's a surf rock inspired song with horns and there's there's dancing people all over the place and the dancing is very uh the, all that jazz guy um fossey fossey it's super 60s it's super uh, austin powers mm-hmm. choreography it's very sweet charity yeah you know all of that business and it's that thing where you see that on the tv and when you were in high school you knew that girl who was just into this weird shit you know that girl who just would make zines with like scratch paper and nail polish and glitter spray and staples and pass them out at school and listen to weird foreign music and you're just like where do you even find this shit and Enid's bedroom has a huge like framed HR Puffin stuff poster she has some HR HR Puffin stuff uh, little toys there's, around too there's you know mannequin wig heads everywhere. I love her I love her movable art painting she has the waterfall painting that that moves you know all this crazy stuff in a room and again it's that thing where it's like you know this kid and I know? feel like of course this type of girl had existed before the movie because the yeah. comic was was written in the 90s but there's something about thora's portrayal and performance that just kind of personified it and that was the girl that yeah. w- that everyone modeled their look after this movie that's a chicken and egg thing yeah you know i i was in high school five years before this movie and i knew definitely yeah tons of girls who had that haircut and glasses and Doc Martens and mini skirt and t-shirt. And then just, they all had the lunchbox first for yeah. a purse and they were always with the band. You know, it's just very Janine Garofalo and in, in, in uh, reality bites in reality yep. bites. So it's this character. So you, you, we get to see Enid, this girl Enid. And you kind of get that she relates to all of these other cultures more than what a normal teenage girl should be into. Like she's yeah. not listening to like she's not dancing around her bedroom listening to like Backstreet Boys or NSYNC or Britney Spears. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, on the one hand, it's like I can sit here and say, like, oh, I so relate to like Enid. And and you know, I did. Uh, there was a lot of weird shit that I was into and am into now. But on the other hand, there is a lot of mainstream popular culture that I am very invested in. So, you know, you take the good with the bad. But you, it does cut to their high school graduation. Enid and her best friend Rebecca are nonplussed. This girl, do, this girl doing this speech that she's in like headgear, like she just got in a car accident, <laughs> and she's just kind of throwing out every single cliche that you hear in a graduation speech. Yes, she and, like she stops short of giving us the the Webster's dictionary definition of. of matriculate or something and then it goes into that she's thankful that uh just her and her friend were the only people harmed from this car accident and she doesn't have to rely (laughs) on drinking and drugs to have fun and uh thora says a line that always makes me laugh i loved her so much better when she was an alcoholic and a drug addict she gets in one stupid car crash and suddenly she's little miss perfect (laughs) so this is just kind of the type of observation that enid gives her peers Yes, and yeah, she just doesn't have time for anybody. They get out of graduation, and they 
immediately take off their cap and just stomp on it and flip off the school. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is where we find out that Enid did not earn enough credits to graduate high school. And has to take a summer school I class. love that they find that out when they open up their diploma. And it made me think of when I graduated college and I opened up my diploma, it was the wrong year. <laughs> so it was just a prop graduation yeah. thing that they gave you. <laughs> Not at this high school. And it's interesting that she failed art. I think that she probably just didn't like the teacher and she just didn't go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like Enid's not a dumb kid. She could probably do the work. She just probably didn't do the work. She just probably yeah. never went to class. And when she did, she just didn't do any homework. She didn't turn anything in. And so she just, you just failed. Yeah. So, uh, they had this plan, Enid and Rebecca, that they were going to not go to college. They've got other plans. And the other plans are get a job and get an apartment, I guess. It's really all we ever hear. Live the adult dream when you're 18 years old. It's interesting because I feel like at that point in time, it kind of makes me feel like maybe the comic had been written quite a few years earlier. Because even when I was in high school, all of our teachers were just like, it wasn't like, are you going to college? It was like, where are you going? Sure. You You know, it was not. And it's it's like that now. It's not like, what are you going to do after after high school? It's. What college are you going to? So well, for spend, them to just yeah. say, we're not going, it's kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> what, well, what's your plan then? I mean, this is how punk rock these two are. Yeah. Is they're, they're saying like, fuck the system and going to college. Yeah. We're just going to start life on our own. True. And I don't get that Rebecca, the Scarlett Johansson character, is particularly punk rock. She's just kind of like, can't be bothered with the system. Mm-hmm. She's just like, whatever, I don't care. And they're not stoners. Not that we see. It's, no. You know what I mean? It's just a disinterest. I don't know. It's very interesting. Yeah. That they just are like. They're not quite stoner. buying what society is selling them of what they should be doing. Yeah. But again, it just makes me question like, well, what? I mean, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to just like work in a coffee shop your whole life and like. Live in an apartment. But in the universe in the, of this movie, I guess that's a possibility. Yeah. Because I have a lot to say about what does eventually happen with Rebecca later on. <laughs> uh, that always kind of bugged me. But, um, yeah, so Enid's kind of like, I mean, she's embarrassed that she didn't even graduate high school. <laughs> because one of the big things that that is happening with all of their peers, you know, at this graduation party and everything, that people are just like, Wow. Can you believe it? What 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 we've done? And um they're just like, yeah, dude. Oh, it's so bad. It's almost good. It's just so bad it's gone past good and back to bad again. At least we'll never have to see any of these creepy faces ever again. Unless they're in your summer school class. Shut up. Don't, don't turn around. Why? Why? Don't turn around. Oh my god. <laughs> you guys, I can't believe you made it. Yeah. You graduated high school. Oh, totally amazing. So, what are you guys doing this summer? Nothing. Well, I'm going to this actress workshop and I'm hoping to start auditions soon. <laughs> oh, we have to get together this summer. Yeah. That'll definitely happen. What I also really like about this scene, and you mentioned that you just thought these two characters would just be too mean, which they kind of are when they're shit-talking all their classmates, but there's a scene where Enid looks across the room and she she sees this guy that will never see so-and-so again. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca's just like, good, I don't care. And then Enid's just like, no, that's actually totally depressing. (laughs) <laughs> just because these outcasts that they're familiar with from high school, once they graduate, they're just going to be gone. Yeah. So you kind of get that Enid does have this reflection about her that she does kind of have empathy for other people. Yeah. And she does kind of think about the world as a whole and is very thoughtful about it. Yeah. And I like that the movie isn't doesn't quite hit you over the head with it. You just get these small moments with her. Yes. 
for the most part. What they're annoyed at is they're annoyed at how just kind of basic everybody can be. Yes. And, and I mean, both you and I can relate to that whenever we go out to bars. <laughs> I feel like when we're at bars, particularly when there's a lot of straight people, we will be the Enid and Rebecca just sitting yeah. in the corner, shit talking everyone. Yeah. And just the idea of like, well, what are you going to do this summer? And it's like, well, why do we have to do something? Yeah. Well, I'm going to take this actor's work. It's like, just these, of course you are. These bullshit questions like, that you always of, get asked when you graduate high school. Of course you're going to take an actor's workshop and then you're going to start doing auditions. It's like, whatever, shut up. Like, we're just going to hang out. Like, school's over. We're graduated. So, yeah, the idea is just like, what? Why does it have to be a certain way that everybody just feels like, well, now that we've graduated, now we do this. Now we take a trip. And then when we come back from the trip, then we do this. So I get that, you know, and... I think that's what pisses her off about people the most. And it's funny. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. it's funny when you watch some of the shit they say to these people. It's like, it makes me laugh every time. And also just how this scene particularly is directed, that when you first see them at the dance, they're sort of swaying back and forth yeah. to this really stupid uh, music yeah, that they're playing, that they got like a... Who, who sings at the Dresden? Marty and Elaine. Like a Marty and Elaine type <laughs> to do this graduation reception. Sure. They also have that really great like uh, rap presentation. Yeah. Did you know one of the rappers was on Salute Your Shorts? Yes, it's Venus de Milo. Yeah. <laughs> From Salute Your Shorts. And they both just give themselves a look of just like these fucking assholes. Yeah, because it's a really shitty song and they're in like these like... You know, like TLC ripoff, like costumes, and you know, it's it's awful, it's bad. And but the thing is, I think all the all the graduates are thinking this is terrible. But it's just one of those things that they're just like, no, we're going to do this in earnest and like put on this performance. And these two are just like, what in the fuck is going on? But yeah, I I, I can see how some people would be like, oh, that Enid, she just has an answer for everything. Um, because I often have an answer for everything. This is very but, true. Um, but um, she is endearing at the end of the day. So how do we get to uh, Cafe 50s? What's it called? So um, you kind of just get a glimpse of what these two do on like a weekend that they meet at this coffee shop. Um, the Quality Cafe. The Quality Cafe. You get that great scene where she's drawing that couple... Yes. In a very... uh, Satanist. um, Crumb. Yeah. It's a very R. Crumb style. It's very R. Crumb style when she's doing a caricature of this couple. And she's convinced that they're Satanists. (laughs) And they're going to follow them. (laughs) Why she thinks they're Satanists, like, they are not dressed crazy. They just look kooky. The guy's bald and kind of has a goatee. So he looks a little bit like Anton LaVey, the leader of the Church of Satan. But other than other than that, the woman just has like crazy kind of curly hair. Uh, this is also the scene that Thora is wearing her T Rex shirt, Raptor, the Raptor shirt, the very iconic Raptor shirt. Yeah, and they're gonna go follow him. Yes, uh, she's convinced that they're Satanists, and they get up and they leave the Quality Cafe. And when they walk outside, they both open up umbrellas in broad daylight. Mm-hmm. Would this have been something that you would have done in high school? Is follow people? We wouldn't have followed that them. you think that were like Satanists. We wouldn't have followed them, but we would have fully just like made up an entire like backstory and like the next ten years of their lives, and probably would have just been on the phone talking to each other and been like, "What do you think the Satanists are doing right now?" Yeah, and just like talk about their children that we made up and like their dogs and stuff, and just make up. That's what we did mostly. Sure. We would just make up life stories for everybody. So follow, they follow the Satanists and, uh, oh, look, there's pants. <laughs> Pete always really likes the moment where they're walking down the street and they just see some pants. There's a pair of pants on the ground laid out and the way, I think it's Rebecca that just says, look, there's pants. But just that sentence is so funny to me. Look, there's pants. Yeah. Like it's not like look, there's a pair of pants. There are some pants. Look, there's pants. And then they just keep walking. And the pants are there. It's just this pair of jeans are on the floor for most of the movie. 
They're symbolic. The pants. Well, <laughs> speaking of speaking of symbolism, they uh, they pass by the old man at the bus, waiting for the bus that isn't coming. Yes, there's an old man in a suit. He clearly has dementia, and he's sitting on a bus stop bench. And Enid tells him that the bus line doesn't run anymore. So the bus is never going to come. And he just kind of doesn't say anything or says like, oh, no, it's coming. Somewhere. You don't know what you're talking you about. You don't know what you're talking about. And then they leave him. But this guy becomes like... He's recurring. A recurring character and a, a point throughout this movie. So while it is like funny and dry and there's like these crazy moments, it does have also these weird little like... It is that crazy artsy movie that I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, at the end of the day. So um, they get lost chasing the Satanists. And they discover Wowsville. Wowsville, that's what it's called. I couldn't remember the name. Who knew that there was mini malls in the 1950s? Yeah, so Wells, Wellsville. And the thing is, it's just like, it's just a 50s diner. I, but I feel like if we were just walking down the street in Pasadena <laughs> and we were to discover Wellsville, we would also be obsessed with it. Yes. Well, I feel like in 2020, a themed 50s diner would just be like, what in the fuck? That is weird. Like, I feel like in that at that time, Period. It's just, whatever. Fifties on it. Who cares? But now it's just like, what in the shit? Whose idea? <laughs> Why? Um, but yeah, it's just a fifties diner. Like, who cares? It's just you know. But they they just are fascinated with it. And the thing is, it turns out to be a very poorly thought out fifties diner. There are jukeboxes at the table, but they're like CD player jukeboxes. Who can, who can remember this classic song from the 50s? Who could forget this classic And it's like a gangster rap song. I feel like I've stepped, I stepped into a time warp. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just done poorly. And so that's what also just makes it more fun for the girls and for us because it's terribly executed 50s diner. And that's what that's why they're so just like obsessed with it but it's also kind of what makes ghost world in particular so great as a teen movie because it's not like you're going to be seeing shit like this in a movie like can't hardly wait or clueless like characters would never comment on something like that in a movie no but yeah all. that's but yeah. That's, that's this movie it's like but it's completely yeah, that's the opposite what, of that's those. what makes kind of ghost world so unique yeah yeah, you know going into it that this is not... And they didn't market it that way. No, they didn't try all. to fake us out. You know, it's just this is not that kind of teen... It's not another teen movie, if you will. But it's interesting because it's still a movie about teenagers and they didn't make that mistake. Yeah. They made that mistake with Election. In marketing, you mean? In marketing, oh, yeah. okay, sure. Ma- election was marketed like a teen movie. Yeah. And... Yeah, election is definitely the kind of movie that is too dark for me. I'm just like, I don't like this character. I know I'm not supposed to like her, but I really don't, and I don't like this movie because of it. I might remind me to take election off the docket. Yeah, I feel like I'm. I'm just. Yeah. So Those we get we get introduced to Weird Al. Weird Al is in this movie. Can we can we call you Weird Al? Their server's name is Al. And he has curly hair. So they ask if they can call him Weird Al. Ultimately, we, uh, they play a prank through personal ads. Yes. I also loved looking through the personal ads. I used to love looking up the personal ads on Craigslist, on Misconnection. Because <laughs> I, I always just kind of thought I might show up in them. Did you ever do the same? <laughs> I mean, I would read them, but not not looking for myself. But I just kind of thought, like, maybe my, my future husband is trying to contact me. <laughs> I mean, I just read them because they were amazing. Mm-hmm. and Always weird. Yeah, totally weird. This is the early days of uh, Craigslist. It was the Wild West. You and this was like, whatever the and hell this was like print print personal ads too oh in this movie yes Mm -hmm. yeah um enid and rebecca are looking through a newspaper and come across the actual personal ads right when Enid calls the phone number and the ad it's her delivery is is kind of amazing it's his machine hi it's me 
You're striking blonde. Of course I remember you. Let's get together for lunch sometime. How about Friday at one o'clock? Meet me at my favorite restaurant, Wowsville. <laughs> it's in the mall on Century Parkway. See you there, darling. Oh yeah, and be sure to wear that sexy green card again. <laughs> my favorite restaurant, Wowsville. The thing is, Seymour, the character that they are that they are calling, doesn't hear this message and think oh, like fuck that this is not this going. is not like suspect at all <laughs> but i mean maybe that's just the kind of person seymour is he just he does seem to be kind of i don't know he's a little bit different as well it's interesting how when you read the comic book that seymour is a character that's only in this one scene when he goes to wowsville and he stood up and the girls just kind of think it's weird and sad. Kind of like what, just kind of how they react in the movie. And that's everything that you see. That when they were adapting the movie, Daniel Claus was like, well, I guess let's just take this character and just expand upon it. Sure. And they kind of write out what hap- what would have happened yes. you know, with, with Enid and, and, and Seymour. Um, I think it needs it. Yeah. You know, Reading Ghost World is one thing, and it's just like their adventures. But in a movie like this, you need this kind of an arc. You need something else. And I remember so. reading that Klaus, kind of when he was learning to adapt the screenplay, he initially just put the whole comic into final draft because he just kind of thought maybe that's just how you adapt this. Maybe that's just how you adapt something like this. Mm-hmm. And then he kind of had to rethink all of it. He wrote something completely new. And then he just ended up doing stuff that was new, stuff that was in the comic, and just blending it together. Yeah. And I also think that they did change the story a little bit as they were filming, too. That they okay. were just sort of writing the direction of where it was going to go as they were making it. Sure. Too. Interesting. Well, Especially uh, in the last half. Sure. Well, the man from the personal ad shows up in his green cardigan. That he was wearing <laughs> and that she requested him to wear. It's Steve Buscemi. They get a ride from Josh, played by Brad Renfro. We haven't even talked about Brad Renfro. Mm-hmm. And Josh is from the comic. R.I.P. Brad Renfro. We should talk a little bit about this character. This <laughs> this sad, like, so 20-year-old or 19-year-old. I take it that maybe Josh, like, graduated, like, two years before... Enid and Rebecca. He's not at the graduation. We don't see him anywhere until we see them torturing him at his job. At they the just, Sidewinder. They just walk into this convenience store that he works in and give him hell every day. And the convenience store has like crazy characters. The guy who just is a customer and is constantly shirtless. That guy is ripped. <laughs> that guy is so shredded. Mm-hmm. His body is insane. Yeah. Um, you uh, may remember him from Scary Movie. He plays Doofy. He plays Doofy. He plays Deputy sure. Doofy. Yeah. In Scary Movie. He's also in Bubble Boy. It's America, dude. Learn the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Some of his delivery is really funny, too. When he talks about Grease. He also invented homos. <laughs> Some of his delivery is really great, but he just plays this gross, like, dirt bag with a mullet that hangs out in the convenience store parking lot. And Ian says, this guy rules. Yeah. I mean, these are just sort of the misfit people that Enid loves. <laughs> this guy rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Enid just loves people who are fringe, just... Go yeah. to the beat to their own drum. Don't fit, don't fit in into society. And, you know, I can, I can appreciate that. <laughs> and that's kind of what she st- what she sees in Seymour when she yes. gets to know with them. Yes. When she gets to know him. Yes. Because Seymour is a fucking weirdo. He's a very specific person, just like Enid is. Um, so it stands to reason that they would get along with each other. But uh, Josh works at the convenience store. He's just their friend that they bother. And I'm assuming he has a car, too, because I think he drives him around. Yeah. Because otherwise, why do they need him? They're to just on foot. That? Yeah, they're like trailing Satanists on yeah. foot. Yeah, so they need Josh to drive him around. I was trying to think of if there was anybody from high school that we would just go and hassle at their job. That's a very like 
teenage small town thing to do. Like, so and so's working at the Dairy Queen. Let's go and like hassle him. But when you went to go hassle so and so at the Dairy Queen, would they just hook you up with a bag full of food? Because that's always for us. Yeah. For us, it was if we were driving or if we were anywhere in, you know, East LA, SGV, and we walked into a fast food establishment that someone from our high school worked in, whether we knew them or not, whether, and I have a specific instance that we walked into this McDonald's. And David Chavez was working behind the counter, took our order. David Chavez, biggest shithead in the school. This guy would give everybody trouble, picked fights nonstop. None of us cared for him. I feel like a couple of us got into fights with him. Um, We walk in McDonald's. He's there, takes our order. We get our order and our fucking burgers had like 10 meats each. And there was like he hooked you up ten bags of fries. Like he gave us so much food, <laughs> and we were like, "You better work, David Chavez." <laughs> so it's just one of those things that, like, when you see somebody when you're young and you know somebody at, at, that works somewhere. I worked yeah. in a mall, sure. So we would kind of hassle people at other at other. I may have taken off people's late fees. That I knew, yeah. My video, video store, store job, yeah. See, that's always a good thing to do, yeah. So, it's that it's that thing, you know. When you're a kid and you're working, you hook up your friends or your enemies, I guess. But um, they end up going back to the uh, God. I keep forgetting the name of the place, Wowsville, the Wowsville, to to meet up with <laughs> with Seymour. And he shows up and <laughs> Oh my god. He just ordered a giant glass of milk. That's a vanilla milkshake. And you'll notice that the background of that scene is like a crappy R and B song. Yeah. At Wellsville the fifties diner. Probably anything that was pretty much <laughs> Uh, free to license or was real cheap for production. <laughs> well, not only that, but it's just not 50s music. Mm-hmm. At least in a Johnny Rockets, they're playing like, you know, the Beach Boys and Elvis and stuff. And I don't know what Enid and Rebecca thought would happen, but it just turns kind of sad. As what would happen when you do a, when you respond to a personal ad yeah. and you just have the guy be stood up. Yeah. And they're just kind of struck of just kind of how sad it is. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, he's just sitting there waiting for this girl and she never shows up. Is this something that you or your friends ever would have done? No! Yeah. I don't think... I don't think we would have either. (laughs) No way. That's too much. I feel like... No, we wouldn't have... No. We would have talked about it. We wouldn't have actually done it. Yeah. It gets weird. It got weird, Mama. How does Enid eventually strike up this friendship? So they find out where he lives. More. They go back to his house. How do they find out where he lives? They they follow him. They just follow. They him. just follow these him. two Nancy Drews. Mm-hmm. Love it. They have Josh follow him, and then they go back, and they find his yard building's sale. yard sale. That this is just something that uh, Steve Buscemi's character Seymour. And his roommate and his friends just do is that they just sell their stuff on the weekends. In the carport. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. These these very L.A. style apartments. Mm -hmm. If you lived anywhere in L.A., you've seen buildings like this. And they've got these open carports in the back. Kind of. I mean, one of the first times I've ever seen adult collectors in movies. Just because I feel like this is very common now of just adults that collect toys but Seymour collects vintage records and just anything weird and kitsch. Well, I don't know. I think he mostly collects blues records yeah. and things of that like 30s era. Yeah, that's true. Era. Like he's not like because his records are very specific to yeah. this like 30s blues. He goes into like ragtime but like the difference of like what you think right it's very esoteric what was, what was the size of his records that there's, is looking there's at? 78s mm-hmm. which you have to be really into 
old records for I 78. I mean, if you just buy a normal record player, they play 33 and a half and, you know, 45. But, like, they don't usually play that speed. Um, older record players played that speed, but a lot of new record players don't. Our record player doesn't play 78s. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a specific speed. It's, like, it's very specific type of music. And Enid's just like, oh, well, do you have, like, uh, any... Well, she asks about the Indian... Indian... Indian rock music. Rock music, yeah. And he's like, no. <laughs> but does she buy something right then? She does. Yeah, she buys a record. Because he gave her the Devil Got My Woman mm. record. Which actually is a really good record when she does mm-hmm. play it. But yeah, they just kind of see like, okay, this is his gig. He's kind of a weirdo. And Enid's very fascinated with him, too. Why do you think that is? Um, be- Yeah, because like you said, he's very uh, a specific type of person. He's not just an average basic dude. He's not just like some... She, old guy. She says to Rebecca, uh, when R- Rebecca asks him, like, what's what's the fucking deal with Seymour? Mm-hmm. And she says, I don't know. I kind of like him. He's the exact opposite of everything I really hate. In a way, he's such a clueless dork. He's almost kind of cool. Yeah. And, yeah, the thing is, when we do see his record collection and his bedroom and the memorabilia that he does have, it is very cool. It's very reminiscent of Enid's style and, like, yeah. specific choices of... You know, tchotchkes and things like that. Um, But he is a weirdo. And he's Steve Buscemi and she's Thora Birch. So they are minimum 15 years age difference. And she... Probably closer to 20. And she wants to hook him up with a girlfriend because she says, I don't know. Like, I just feel like if somebody, if an interesting person like you can't find someone that you'd like is there any hope for someone like me yeah i think it's the idea of when she's trying to hook him up sure meanwhile their overall master plan was to move in together yes rebecca and eat it and she always talks about looking at apartments yes and rebecca is very focused on this she's like let's look at these apartments you know have you found a job yet and Enid's just kind of like, she keeps just, she's not very in, into it. She's not very invested in finding this apartment. She really doesn't want to find a job. Yeah. Enid's not the kind of person that could hold a job or would be interested in doing anything that wasn't something that she specifically was had a hand in, I think. I think Enid would only really thrive at a job where she was able to, like, I don't know, create something or be a part of it. I don't think she can function in a minimum wage kind of a situation. Mm-hmm. But Rebecca gets a job at a coffee shop. Yeah. Clearly it's just a Starbucks. Yeah. Green or like a Pete's green apron. And, um, I don't know. Enid, I think kind of takes it as just like, what? like you actually did it. <laughs> well, at first when they're looking for apartments, she dyes her hair green. Yes. Well, Rebecca specifically says, we have to go look at an apartment tomorrow, so don't dress too crazy because, you know, we got to meet these people and we have to make a good impression. And she shows up. So when Rebecca goes to looking meet her, like a punk rocker. She, she has green hair. And, and this like, also is kind of a character note that Enid is someone that has different um, phases or looks. Yes. She has, like, different things that she's obsessed with or is, like, different looks that she's trying on herself. And you take it that this weekend, it's the punk rock look. Yeah. Uh, we get we get a little a little bit of that later on in the, in the movie when Enid's having her yard sale, um, trying to make some money. But, yeah, she's that kind of girl that she – she's not a poser, but she just – isn't really tied down to one specific look. And I think to me, that's okay. Yeah. I'm not just like, Oh, well you can't just be punk today. I'm like, whatever. She can dress however the fuck she wants. Um, because in her like average everyday look, it's not like when she's not doing that, she's just wearing like jelly shoes and like Mm -hmm. crop tops. No, she's still being Enid and wearing t-shirts from the little boy section and like mini skirts. Enid has one type of, like one specific type of look, and then she's just sort of branches out from there. Yeah, on specific days. Yeah. So, kind of an interesting movie, or like an interesting note on this movie of when it was made. 
because this is like early 2000, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. So the internet was a thing, but it wasn't all that sophisticated. Yeah. Like when Eden wants to find a, a Bollywood or like rock and roll Indian music, she has to go track it down from these shithead guys in this comic book store. Yeah. And she has to pay them for it. And you well, get a tape, too. Yeah. So it, it very much harkens back to that time before the internet, before there was YouTube, that Enid had to go hunt all of this stuff down. Yeah. And these are the type of... And she's got a guy who guys does that bootlegs for her. Would get, for, would get these tapes for her. Yeah. They're gross guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's how you did it. Yeah. For the longest time, you know, before eBay or whatever... You just had a hookup, and it was mostly comic book shops yeah. <laughs> where guys would kind of trade this kind of stuff. Bootleg tapes, concerts, and the type of to thing that movies. you don't really see anymore just because of the internet. Yeah. I mean, now there's YouTube. Now there's eBay. Mm-hmm. Now whatever, whatever, you know, Star Wars Holiday Special or Poland Halloween Special. It was just sort of before the internet became so sophisticated that you could track all this stuff down. Yeah. But I mean, even before YouTube in like 2005. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's just like, I want to find a video. Shit. Yeah. It's got to be hosted somewhere. Somebody had to have posted it. And then someone invented YouTube. And that was very smart. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love her reaction of when they go into that comic book store to pay the guy. And they're calling out her, her look. Who are you trying to be, Cindy Lopper? <laughs> and her reaction to it is so funny because she's just like, "Well, it's just not any punk rock look." I love Cindy Lopper just because she has colored hair. He's like Cindy Lopper, and it's like clearly no. She has like a short bob parted down the middle, and she's wearing a leather jacket. Hey, do you have my money? Oh, punk. You know that they've sucked, by the way? Oh, I'm so sorry I've offended you. Don't die, asshole. Get a job. God, fuck you. We going out? You know, it's not like I'm some modern punk dickhead. It's obviously a 1977 original punk rock look. I guess Johnny Buckface over there is too stupid to realize. I didn't really get it either. Everyone's too stupid. I feel like we say that a lot. Yeah, I say it a lot. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but just Enid is the just the nineteen year old that's just like you're not even understanding it. This is an original punk rock look. <laughs> like, why don't you just fucking like know what you're talking about, asshole? Open a book, dummy. But to say it's an original nineteen seventy seven punk rock look, even that is a little pretentious, though. On Enid's part, it's like, all right, calm down. It's just a punk look. <laughs> but yeah. Her her escapades in the in the weird like comic book shop that didn't even have that many comics in it, first of all. Um so Enid kind of ingratiates herself into Seymour's life. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that the screenplay doesn't quite go in a Woody Allen like Manhattan direction. Thank God. I think it's a it has a little more going for it. With yeah. how it portrays the relationship. Yeah. That it kind of unfolds of how you would expect these two characters would react with each other if they were to exist off the page. I right. think that was probably the idea of when they were developing these two's relationship. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think y- y- give this character of Seymour credit because I think he does understand that Enid is like 18 years old and mm-hmm. he's probably in his early 40s. I think he's mainly just gobsmacked and interested why this 18-year-old girl would find him so fascinating. Yeah. Cuz there's cuz Seymour doesn't think there's anything cool about him. And even when uh she's trying to hook him up, he says to her, "I don't want to meet anyone who shares my interests. I I hate my interests." Yeah, talk just like, mainly Like why would you even want to date me? Yeah. And I think he kind of gets how obsessive his collection is. Which I have worked at Barnes & Noble, so I have dealt with adult men that collect toys that will make you thumb through all of the pop vinyl boxes for the one that doesn't have a little nick in them. <laughs> and I've seen grown men quite literally cry when they don't get 
a specific toy that they want. Yeah. That was like a special edition toy. So yeah, like I've totally dealt with weirdos like that at jobs that I've worked at. Yeah. That it just obsessively collects stuff as an adult like that. You see it a little bit when Enid kind of tricks Rebecca into going to what she says is a party at Seymour's house, but it's really just kind of a get together for his collector friends to kind of trade records or purchase buy and sell records from each other. Um, and these guys are very particular about quality and scratches and I don't buy scratched records and all of that. So what's all this about enlarged holes and tight cracks? <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's what Seymour kind of means where he's just like, yes, this is my collection and this is something that I'm passionate about. But at the same time, I fully understand that this is crazy and it's like mm-hmm. over the top, which it is. Um, his, little, his little room's pretty cute, though. Yeah, but there's so many records. It's like, how? Can, like, what are you going to do with them? And this that? is when we're introduced to the cook's chicken Painting and drawing. So talk a little bit about that. What is that? So uh, Seymour works for uh, Cook's Chicken. He's an executive over Cook's Chicken. I'm not really sure what he does there. But um, Cook's Chicken is sort of a Sambo's restaurant that had a a very politically incorrect mascot of a black man. And then they just sort of whitewashed it over to just a different image, but racism is still ingrained in the brand. That's kind of a big thing. That That's also like a big theme with that part of the movie of, of when Enid brings it to her art class mm-hmm. is just how racism is still out in the open, but it's just kind of hidden there. Yeah. I think that's kind of an interesting little element to the script too. Yes, because he does have this memorabilia from the 30s and he does listen to a lot of black musicians. He's got the these items in his room and, you know, he did comes across this poster and it's, you know, it's a very caricatured uh, minstrel image. And she's just like, what is this? Like, are you in the clan or something? And he's like, no, it's like, it's my job, but it's, you know, it's it's from their history and all that. And so... It's kind of a, a, not a side storyline, but it goes along with Enid's summer school class. Oh, we need to talk about Enid's summer school class still. Yeah. She's, she's got to finish up these credits that she missed to graduate. And so she has to take an art class at her high school uh, in summer. And the art teacher is played by Ileana Douglas. And I love Ileana Douglas. She's so good. She's playing this type of character that Enid can't stand. Just somebody that's just super full of shit, just super basic, just like spouting all of these like fake, you know, pleasantries about art and feminism. And when Enid is like actually... A talented artist, you know, she has a point of view, she has a specific style, and it's not mainstream, and it's very much something that could become big eventually, but... There wasn't really an appreciation for it in in an authentic way by her, by the teacher. Yeah. Um, There's some really good stuff with... With Ileana Douglas. Mm-hmm. Should we go ahead and play now? Yeah. Okay. Mother. Mirror. Mirror. Mother. Mirror. Mother. Mirror. Mirror. Mother. 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 Mirror. I like to show it to people that I'm meeting for the first time because I think it says so much about who I am and what it feels like to inhabit my specific skin. (laughs) And this is exactly what I'm hoping to get from each of you over the course of this summer. A picture of your own self-exploration. Now, my own background is in video and performance art. 
But I'm hoping that doesn't influence you too much and you'll find your own ways of externalizing the internal. Externalizing the internal. And just forcing her students to watch this stupid short movie. Yeah. That just sort of, this woman is just kind of, she didn't quite become like the Andy Warhol of her time. So she just (laughs) like, so she just sort of forces this pretentious art onto her students as her introduction. Yeah. This little art class movie, uh, art house movie that she plays, it's, it very much plays like a fake art house movie inside of another movie, which is exactly what it is. But well, also it works very, all of these art scenes, um, Terry Zweigoff later did art school confidential, which is pretty much all of these scenes done as a feature movie. Yeah. If you have, if you've ever seen art school confidential, which I have not, and I feel like that one kind of fell victim to incorrect marketing. Sure. When you say? I think so. I didn't end up seeing it, but I remember seeing the trailers, and it looked like it was this wacky college, like, it's like a wacky college movie, but set in art school. But then when I read the reviews, I was like, oh, this is not that at all. I mean, has everyone had a tampon in a teacup moment? Of something that they just don't get. <laughs> this c- character in the class with her. I feel I like I have gone to college with this one. This girl is just serving up this teacher everything that she wants to hear. She is just taking every bit of information that the teacher is giving her and just like vomiting it back in a way that the teacher can be like, yes, exactly. This is what I'm talking about mm-hmm. with found art found object art and repressed femininity uh, in the form of a tampon sitting in a teacup. Um, and Enid just sits there and rolls her eyes. At Meanwhile, all of it. Enid has done this portrait of Don Knotts that I would fully have framed in my living room. I want... It's his machine. Oh, oh our, our cat just yeah. straight up ran across the <laughs> iPad. <laughs> But I w- but I think uh, I would also have uh, the Don Knotts portrait framed in the living room, and I would not uh, be mad at people kids cheering for that. And it's one of those things that when Ileana Douglas asked her, like, "What does this picture mean to you?" Yeah, and she's just like, "I don't know. I just like Don I Knotts. Just like Don Knotts." And there's something, and there's kind of beauty in that. That yeah, she's just sort of not really getting. And the thing is, it's a good portrait. Yeah. It's it's an illustration. Uh, it's uh, it looks to be like a um, I don't know if it's a watercolor, but it's painting. But it's an illustrative style. It's very it's it's well done, and I would have it as my as my home screen wallpaper on my phone. Yeah, if I can find it. Um, but yeah, the the, the teacher is just like she just kind of shakes her head. She's like, all right, whatever with this fucking Don nuts. Enid turns in a journal. Yeah. As an assignment. And it, and you know that probably Enid just didn't do the assignment. So she's just like, well, I'm just going to turn in my journal. Yeah, here, take this. <laughs> here, take this. <laughs> and what does she call them? She calls them like little drawings or something. Yeah. Little cartoons. Very dismissive. Mm-hmm. Very dismissive of Enid's work. And um, that's, so that's why she's just like, Ugh, fuck this class. Like, fuck this teacher. But it's interesting of how the character is played by Ileana that... She's not completely clueless that she still sees potential in Enid because she does offer the scholarship. So she does see something in her. Yeah. Even though she doesn't quite get across kind of how she's taking it for granted in class. I mean, the whole scholarship situation comes after Enid brings in this portrait from Cook's Chicken as a found object art piece. You're right. The teacher does see the significance of, you know, the hidden racism that used to be overt racism. And and she kind of gets that. But um, at that point, it's a little bit too late Mm -hmm. because when she does when she does have an exhibit for the class, Enid's just like she doesn't even care to show up. First of all, she's going to go super duper late. But then when she finally does get around to talking to Seymour. She's just like, no, forget it. We'll just skip it. She just says, and it, on the one hand, I watch it. And I'm just like, God, she's such an asshole. She doesn't even go to her like exhibit for like her work. This is like 
an art thing. She's something she's actually interested in. But the entire summer, this woman has just been like shitting on all of her stuff. So I do get that too. Um, I would like to talk about the scene where she, well, two scenes, one leads to the other is where she has Seymour take her into the adult bookstore. Yes. Does this bring up any memories of you when you would first go into adult bookstores, porn stores with your friends and you just thought it was so hilarious? I mean, we weren't like laughing hysterically at the top of our lungs and calling everyone freaks and perverts. We had a little bit more discretion than that. But I do remember going into, you know, adult bookstores, a romantics, romantics a, yep. le- a le sex shop. There's this town has multiple multiple shops that begin with le sex. Very interesting when you go in for the first time. It's jarring. It's very like, woo. Yeah. I still kind of Sen- feel that way. Overload. But um that's why I kind of like it though. <laughs> is I still feel like it's a place where I prob- where I'm probably too a little too <laughs> young for. And that's kind of like the rush that you get when you go in. And I love that Enid and Rebecca were just waiting for some boy to take them in there. That they yeah. couldn't go in by themselves. She specifically says we can't find a boy. Old girls. Yeah. But they had to find some guy to take in. We can't find a boy to take with. us. Yeah. The way Steve Buscemi plays this scene is very funny. Because um, he knows he's just like, oh my God, like I should not be in the store with this girl. Like, uh because she's so much younger than him. Yeah, it's it's an interesting scene. And when she's just like, you have to loan me the money to buy this. And it's like, all right, loan me the money. Like, she's going to pay him back. She has no intention of paying him back. I don't remember <laughs> how Enid gets the Catwoman cow in the graphic novel. Yeah, I don't either. But, I mean, that's like an iconic image is yeah. Enid with uh, the little Catwoman mask. Give me all your money, bitch. So, also, kind of leading into this scene, working in retail, food industry, I can so relate to this moment with Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> and it's one of those things that when you're young, you feel like, oh, I like re- I relate to Enid the most. And then when you get older, I realized, oh, no, I'm the Rebecca <laughs> of when you just hear Scarlett's delivery of how over working with the public she is that's just like we can all relate to that he does that every single day <clears throat> have a decaf mocha to go mm-hmm. one decaf mocha decaf mocha you no know, I do not want a biscotti come on how can you stand all these assholes some people are okay but mostly I just feel like poisoning everybody well at least the wheelchair guy is entertaining he doesn't even need that wheelchair. He's just totally lazy. <laughs> that rules. No, it really doesn't. You'll see. You get totally sick of all the creeps and losers and weirdos. But those are our people. Yeah, well. So when are you going to get a job? I'm working on it. Got a few leads. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I'll get a job next week. I love that Enid says in several occasions, she says, I'll get a job next week. And then one time she says, I'll get a job tomorrow. Like, I'll just, I'm going to go get a job. To- I'll go pick me up one of those jobs. So, <laughs> I mean, I have worked at, I mean, my current job, I see people in wheelchairs all the time that we're just like, you really don't need that wheelchair. You're just too lazy to walk. <laughs> oh my God. That it's just like all the fucking weirdos that you see every single day. Because at my job... At a grocery shall store, remain lame. We, we, see, lame. we see the same people every single day there. Yeah. Just all these fucking weirdos, which, I mean, I love my job, but it's just like, it can just get great in. And you you want to kind of love all of the underdog weirdos, or as Enid says, our people, but at the same time, it just gets old. So I yeah. can absolutely relate to Scarlett Johansson in this scene. Yeah. Um I can see too where Enid's just like, oh my God, you have to put on that apron and go in every day. And Enid's never really had a traditional job before too. Yeah. So that's the thing to her. It's just like, you're just giving up your life. 
like for what, you know? But if they do want to get this apartment, move out of their parents' house, then they're going to have to eventually, like, you know, got to work. Uh, Enid lives with her father, played by Bob Balaban. Love Bob. Bob very Balaban. small role, but he he plays it very funny. It's a very Bob Balaban performance. Enid has a bathroom in her bedroom, and while we were watching it the other day, I thought, did her father give her the master bedroom in this apartment just because that's the kind of guy he is? Because it seems like that's what happened. Sure. Because <laughs> Enid has a really, that big, really big bedroom with a bathroom in it in an, in an apartment in you know somewhere out in the valley. When they do go look for apartments, Enid's just very sour about the whole thing. What did she say about the neighborhood? What's up with this weird neighborhood? Yeah. It's a totally normal neighborhood. <laughs> and Rebecca's like, what? Like, what are you bitching about? It's a totally normal neighborhood. <laughs> like, why do you just have to be so weird about sh- about?" shit like this Mm -hmm. this was their plan all along but now when it's getting real i think she just doesn't want to get a job yeah she doesn't want to move out yeah and it's like if you don't have to get a job fucking don't do it working sucks Mm -hmm. (laughs) i mean working every day blows taken from someone and i'm glad that my my parents did this when i turned 18 and i went to college it was just like all right pack up the car you're going to college yeah (laughs) well you didn't live in a town that their college was in so you had to yeah so it's life. like you just kind of had to hit the road you had, you to, had to spray gravel on the on the driveway yeah kick rocks mm-hmm. and i wouldn't have any any other way not in la though enid is fully mm-hmm. just i mean she's not going to college so she doesn't have to go live in a dorm and so she's just staying in the apartment with her dad and it's like like i said if she doesn't have to get a job she's just like fuck man why would i want to do that put up with these assholes you know upsell people on the larger size of soda all that nonsense that's not her gig and it never will be no (laughs) people like enid will always have problems in life adjusting to it because they don't want to conform to society do we get multiple jobs or do we just get the movie theater we just get the movie theater. She, uh, We don't see the other job, and that's the job that Terry Gar gets her. Oh, yeah, the computer. Working in computers. Yeah. I take it that maybe they shot stuff like that, and they just didn't need it. Yeah. Well, she gets a job at a movie theater. It does not go well. She gets fired on her first day. The type of movie theater that if you've, I mean, kind of any movie theater in America. It's a multiplex. I feel like you've been in this multiplex at one at one time of your life. Yeah. Well, the scene that they shot of Enid working at this multiplex, it's clearly the middle of the day. The sun is shining right through the huge windows into the concession stand. And, you know, when you think about a movie theater in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, it's like, who's going to the fucking movies? Weirdos. Weirdos. People who don't have jobs. Yep. So it's retirees or weirdos. And those are the people that Enid is um, working with. And that's when she loses her job because she just can't, you know, deal with the upselling and all of that nonsense. But I think it was a very specific choice because, you know, when you work at a movie theater, if it's nighttime, if it's even on a weekday after dark at a movie theater, it's too busy. There's not really time to just goof off or whatever but at this point it was like there's nobody there and um so she had time to just kind of fuck with the weirdos that came up to her and she fucked with them enough to lose her job on the same day and rebecca what does rebecca tell her like what kind of moron what kind of a moron loses (laughs) a job after one day of work so i mean she she ultimately has a big falling out with rebecca about this Job situation about the apartment, you know, Rebecca's dead set on on this plan that they had. And Enid starts to shit on it. She's just like, ooh, you're, you're so stuck to this plan we've had since the seventh grade. Your own apartment. Which to me, I say, well, fuck yeah. Like, we're not going to college. What the hell else are we supposed to do? Mm-hmm. Like, what, what are you saying? Like, if we're not going to do that, then what is the big, like, rebellion? Just go live, like, in a tent? Like, in a car that we don't even have, like go live in a treehouse. I don't know. Yeah. So it's clearly Enid is just is is the asshole in this situation. <laughs> so meanwhile, with Seymour, 
Seymour ends up going out on a date with the woman from the personal ad. Yes, the actual con- woman. The actual yeah. woman. From when he uh, posted the ad in the first place. And um, she just – she calls him, leaves him a message, and she says, you know, it's just it, – I know it's been a while, but I think I'm the person, you know, that you're talking about. And, and they meet up. This poor woman seems really into Steve Buscemi, though. Yeah, she does. Like, she's given it an effort. Yeah, she's really trying. But again, she is just kind of like, you know, your everyday kind of a gal. Just your basic yeah, woman. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's like, but what type of woman would Seymour date? I guess that's just kind of the big question of the movie is that what type of woman would he be with? Yeah. He's kind of a lost cause. I think. <laughs> and we can't say anything uh, kind of thing. Uh, everything about Steve Buscemi's performance is so good. I don't think he's ever been better utilized in a movie than this. And it's kind of bullshit of when the Oscars came around that, like, sure, we'll nominate John Voight for Ali, but not Steve Buscemi. Uh huh. In a role that's so much more interesting and memorable. And it's kind of it is still talked about twenty years later. Yeah, I didn't even know John Voight was in Ali. Who won that year? Uh, uh Jim Broadbent for Iris. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like this kind of performances that aren't really talked about a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a lot going on with Seymour and like this girl, and when Enid finds out that you know he is seeing somebody, she gets very jealous. She's not romantically interested in Seymour, but she's jealous nonetheless because he does pay attention to her Mm -hmm. and takes her places and does stuff that she wants to do and all that. So even though she is spending most of the movie trying to get him interested in women, when he does show interest in one, she gets super jealous and tries, tries to drive this woman off and ultimately ends up like breaking up the relationship because she's so distraught over everything Mm -hmm. that she ends up getting drunk at Seymour's house. And I mean, it's It's kind of the whole fallout of the art show. Yeah. That Enid is really seeing the consequences of her not taking responsibility, not taking responsibility of going to the art show of not taking a kind of not being a little more forward and honest with Rebecca too. So she shows up at Seymour's house. Mm -hmm. And while she's there, uh, I mean, she pulls out this bottle of champagne out of the fridge. Yeah. They're saving it for their two month anniversary, but she just goes ahead and opens it Mm -hmm. and, um, proceeds to drink the entire bottle. And they end up hooking up with each other and sleeping with each other. Yeah. And it turns kind of weird, understandably. Yeah, totally. She disappears for a while after this. Yeah. She was supposed to move in with Rebecca, and she doesn't show. This is when Seymour shows up to uh, Rebecca's doorstep, and she kind of... Rebecca kind of in- insinuates, like, well, you know, like, the circumstances that we met you, right? And he's like, no. And then that's when she tells him that they answered the personal ad. Yes. The entire time, Enid had never revealed that that was how they met, like, mm-hmm. how she found out about him and all that. So... Uh, Rebecca tells him this. She like pulls out Enid's one of Enid's journals, you know, where she j- first, you know, was sketching about it, and uh, Seymour sitting in there looking all sad and depressed. And I think, I think in one of the images it says something like, "There's an, there's like, it's him sitting at Wow's stood up, yeah, looking all sad, yeah." So, and then he turns a page and he sees a, a, a sketch of Josh with like hearts around it. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, all right, fuck this. And then he goes to try to beat up Josh. And he has a heart attack. And he gets put in the hospital. Or maybe yeah. maybe not like a heart attack or a panic attack or something. Yeah. Well, we also see that he, he previous to this, we saw that he has a really bad back. Yeah. That he has to wear like a truss kind of a girdle situation. Because his back is really bad. So he may have thrown his back out. A combination of a bunch of things. But he ends up in the hospital. And um, Enid goes to see him and kind of lets him know that, like, yes, that did happen, but 
you know, I did kind of think you were a weirdo at first, but that's when she tells him that uh, he's her hero. Yeah, she thinks that he's cool. Yeah. That even though they did meet under weird, not right circumstances, there is something genuine about their friendship that yeah. she does kind of look up to him. Yeah. I know I'm just a dork. You are not a dork. Sure I am. You're such a stupid idiot. Did you even look through the rest of the book? See? Hero. So, after this, I mean, Seymour breaks up with the other, yeah. the other woman. Mm-hmm. But he broke up with her after he hooked up with Enid, thinking that he was going to start something with her. Yes. Which is unfortunate. Yeah. But but I feel like it, it never would have worked out between these co- these two people, anyways. Yeah, I agree. That was that wasn't going to go anywhere. But um, in this last like ten minutes of the movie, or I mean, maybe even like five minutes, is that she seems to be in an okay place with Re- Rebecca because she meets Rebecca outside of the hospital, and they seem like well, yeah. I guess it just didn't work out. We're still friends, so there's always that. Yeah. Um, and Rebecca was in a place where she was going to live in this apartment by herself. Yeah. She's, she went and saw the place, liked it, and was like, I'm going to move in. Rebecca, so if you're going to move in, then come and do it. But if not, then... Rebecca can find another roommate. And you kind of get, what is the future of these two characters? Are they going to be still friends in five years? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like, are they? Ju- is it just sort of... These two characters going in separate directions of their life, which happens with people that you were once close to and then you just kind of are done with each other. Yeah. And you just kind of go your separate ways. I've definitely had have had people like that in my life that I was once close to that I don't really talk to anymore. Yeah. um, It's interesting because Rebecca is now like now she has responsibility. She has rents to pay and all that. So she really does have to focus on work. I have problems uh reconciling rebecca working at a coffee shop and being able to afford her own apartment probably making like 650 an hour but whatever we just have to accept that for the purposes of this movie but um but yeah that's the thing and it's like you know when she was sitting outside of the hospital with enid talking to her she had her apron and her in her purse you could see her work apron in there and she was dressed a little bit more like adult yeah you know and enid was just kind of dressed like enid so what do you make of the ending of this movie because it ends on, i don't know is because it ends in the bus with she sees the old man that they walk past finally get on the bus it's the come bus showed up the bus showed up so enid uh Gets all dressed up. She packs a suitcase. She wakes. At the, she waits at the bus stop, and she gets on the bus, and it goes across those downtown bridges. Mm-hmm. What bridges are those? Uh, that was the Sixth Street, which is no longer there. Yeah, so it goes across the Sixth Street. So there's been a lot of speculation with fans that this ending uh, is a metaphor for suicide. And Daniel has said, yeah, it could be. It's hard to figure out why people have that response. The first time I heard it, I said, what? You're out of your mind. What are you talking about? But I've heard that hundreds of times. So even like the writer of the movie, when he's heard it's a metaphor for suicide, just really didn't get it. And that was my first response when I heard that from a coworker of mine at the video store when I worked at. That I'm just like, really? Really? That's what you got from that ending? I don't think I got that from the ending when the first time I saw it, but I thought it was just an abstract ending. The bus shows up for this old man 
from the canceled bus line. It is an old timey bus, mm-hmm. and he gets on it and it drives away. Then, like you said, Enid goes home. She gets dressed up, sits at the same bus stop, and the bus picks her up and drives her away. It's and more, it's an empty bus with her sitting in the It's back. more just a metaphor for kind of moving on into an unknown future. Yeah. That's what I kind of buy from it. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. I never was just like, oh, well, maybe she is leaving and maybe she's taking this bus to, to heaven. But I don't know. Yeah. I never really bought it. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, ultimately, I rewatched this movie... Because it's more funny than it is awkward or yeah. cringy you kind or of, you dark. Re- you remember the first yeah. probably hour of this movie yeah. a lot more. The too. funny stuff. The it's all the funny stuff. And the, and the Wowsville and Weird Al and, and all of that. And their, two deli- their deliveries, their chemistry is so great. The supporting it, characters are funny. And it kind of just reminds you of when you were young and just felt like an outsider. That Enid yeah. and Rebecca just really spoke to you. Yeah. Like that part in your, of your life where you were like, you're pretty much an adult, but you're still not really part of like functioning society because you mm-hmm. still don't, you know, if maybe you did have a job, but it's just like, you know, just for, mu- for your own money to have. Yeah. You know, So you just were observing the world around you, not really like a big part of it. And you're constantly asked, what are you going to do with your life? Yeah. From your peers and all these grownups around you. And you just don't really know how to respond to it. Yeah. Too. I still kind of feel like that. (laughs) I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True. And just kind of relating it to the kind of, LGBT and gay experience that gay people always feel like outsiders. Yeah. Like Enid and Rebecca. And it speaks to us. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, and knowing, and just this type, of, like I said, this type of girl, you know, this girl, mm-hmm. you may have been this girl, may have been best friends with her, but yeah, definitely that kind of fringe experience is just, if you know it and you remember it and you were a part of it is very much something that's, was formative for you. And I definitely, like I said, I've, I've known her and I've, but I've also been her and Enid Coleslaw. What a name. Her name is Enid Coleslaw. Enid Coleslaw is an anagram of Daniel Klaus. Sure. Yep. Which I love. Yeah. I wish my last And I like that Daniel Klaus didn't write on a misunderstood like Donnie Darko type. He wrote, he wrote kind of his, uh, Avatar as a girl, yeah. which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It is really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll post images from uh, from the graphic novel, some side-by-sides of the two Enids. And even uh, Rebecca, I yeah. think, looks kind of like Scarlet, too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think this movie is very watchable. And it still, I think, speaks to young people. That I always yeah. really like to ask younger coworkers of mine that are either kind of in their late teens, early twenties. I think that uh, I had a coworker of mine from Barnes and Noble that actually asked me in the break room one day, "Have you ever heard of a movie called Ghost World?" <laughs> that I'm just like, "Oh, bitch, have I heard of Ghost World?" <laughs> and we could talk about Ghost World, and it just was something that she had just discovered. Yeah. Being probably 19 years old, and it just really spoke to her. Yeah. So it still kind of connects to young people. And I like that it doesn't revolve around the internet or texting, that it was made at a very specific time yeah. in movies where you just didn't really see that in people's lives. And I think it's what makes it so watchable and endearing now. Yeah, very true. I agree. I agree with all of it. I love Ghost World. So good. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was afraid of how like cool or something that it was going to be, but ultimately it's it's funny and it's relatable. It's definitely it's relatable. Even if even if Enid and Rebecca are a little bit more fringe for you or maybe a little bit more in your face than you would be. It's it's definitely relatable and and worth the watch and the rewatch just because it is so funny. 
Justice for Thora Birch, I want to see her more in movies. <laughs> and it's one of yeah. those things that I kind of, when I look at Thora Birch's career, that she was so on the right track at this time, and then she dropped off the radar yeah. right after this movie. Yeah. And she was like nominated for a Golden Globe for this movie, too. So she did get recognition from it. And I almost think if it's kind of Hollywood sexism at work, that was she just put on Do Not Cast List by people i know that she had a big falling out with alexander payne during election that she was cast in election and then she was fired I from that movie that, i thought that a lot of it was uh her father who was her manager no was just kind of a shithead i mean her father is sort of a piece of work but that's not what i got from all the election stuff i don't think it's really no, not election but just in general sure. why her career kind of i mean maybe but didn't go anywhere that's kind of shitty though yeah, I mean, bad representation will will uh, get you blacklisted, too. Yeah, but I just want to see more Thora Birch. Yeah, I agree. I lo- I'd love to see some more of her um, now. But, you know, we'll see. And we're still waiting for Scarlett Johansson's career to take off. <laughs> I tell you what. She's got a future. Mm-hmm. That one. Yep. That one. I'm telling you. You heard it here first. Um do you think we'll see Thora Birch in another Hocus Pocus? I mean, I would hope so. <laughs> They're bringing back Sarah, Bet, and Kathy. Why can't they call back Thora? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. I would love to see. We were just watching a little bit of Hocus Pocus today. Yeah. And little also, Danny. Movies, that made Danny. Us, uh, movies that made us gay all-star. Second Thora Birch movie. Yes, indeed. She's on the radar. And yeah, whatever happened to that ScarJo? Yeah. Maybe one day she'll get lucky. When what do she, you have to say? When's she finally going to get those Oscar nominations? <laughs> Don't hold your breath. Well, do you have any final thoughts on Ghost World? I think we wrapped it up. Yeah. Ghost World. I love this movie. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it is. It's very good. Um, what can we say? What can we say? Um, I definitely recommend it. We both We both do. If you haven't seen it. Go out, check it out. It's probably probably it's available for it's a, rent. And there's streaming. a fine there's a fine criterion of it that I own. It was Criterion. There is. It was. It's. It is now officially part of the Criterion Collection. I would imagine that Crumb will be following it soon. So we talked a lot about Crumb, but that is about the uh, artist Robert Crumb, and um, it's a documentary that this uh, that. Terry Zweigoff. And didn't Terry Zweigoff, isn't he sort of in the movie as himself? Like, he, the director, make friend, makes friends with Crumb. Yeah. And it's it's sort of about their relationship as filmmaker and subject. Yes. Um, so, uh, so Ghost World is available for streaming right now on Amazon Prime Video. If, you, uh, if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, you can go watch it there. Otherwise, you can rent it on Amazon. Apple TV, Amazon Prime, Fandango Now, and Vudu. So go and check it out. There's tons of clips on YouTube, so you can get a kind of a feel for it. And um, I hope that we uh, gave you some insight on into this awesome movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, while you are out there on the internet looking for Ghost World, you should definitely... Look us up on Patreon. Look us up on Patreon. We have uh, little tiers that you can join, the dollar, $5, and $10 level. There's mm-hmm. benefits to each of them. We recommend the $10 one because you get the movie commentary, the watch with us. Yes, indeed. We just recorded Beetlejuice, and it was a lot of fun. Yes, indeed. So if you are at the $10 level, which is one extra value meal a month. Oh, yeah. A trip to Starbucks is less. Mm-hmm. Or, no, it's more. Yeah. If you go to Starbucks twice in an entire month, you've more than covered the Patreon tier. So uh, you should definitely check out some of the fun benefits we have. Do we have some shout outs to subscribers? Yes, we do. It is a subscriber shout out time. This is for Everybody that is currently subscribed to our Patreon, we're going to go ahead and say hello to all of you lovely people, including Mitchell Ralston, Rufino Cabong, 
Christine Asher, Nick Thomas, John Miller, Jessica Something, Melinda and Jim Shirley, Aaron Bent, M. Lamelli, and Joshua Clement. Thank you so much, everybody, for subscribing. You guys are amazing. You guys rock. You guys rock, indeed. Check out your inboxes coming October 1st for our first spooky, wookie, kooky Halloween edition of the newsletter. newsletter. You'll see the entire October lineup. I have it all finished. Yes, indeed. If you are in the $5 tier. So check us out at www.patreon slash movies that made us gay. But you know what else you can do? Write us a review on iTunes. Yes. You can also give us five stars when you're on iTunes. We would love that too. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We will see you next week, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.